Right. Can I welcome everyone to the Environment and Sustainability Scrutiny Committee being held via the Microsoft Soft Teams today, Tuesday, the 23rd of March 2021, to consider matters contained in the following agenda. This meeting will be recorded and made available to view via the Council website, except for discussions involving confidential or exempt items. Therefore, the images and order of those uh, individuals speaking will be publicly available to all via the recording on the Council website at www.confiri.gov.uk. Apologies there. Chair, we have apologies from Councillor Bob Owen, and I can see that Councillor uh, Scriven is not in attendance. Right, okay, so you may turn up anyway. Yeah. Declaration of interest, council and officers reminder of their personal responsibility to declare any personal and or prejudicial interest in respect of, of any items of business on this agenda in accordance with our local government act 2000, the council constitution and the code of conduct of both councillors and officers. Any declaration of interest? None? Right then, go to item three, Environmental and Sustainability Scrutiny Committee meeting held on the 9th of February 2021 for accuracy on from pages one to six. Page one, two, three, four, five, and six. Someone move, it's true record or? Move that chair. Is that seconded? Second. Then? second. Right, we go to the, the vote then now on it. Kath. Yes, chair, this will now appear in uh, in front of members. Just hold for the moment. It's just showing. If anybody can't see it, can they please uh, let, let us know and we'll take a verbal vote. I can't see it. Do you, do you agree that it's your record, Councillor Priest? Yes. Thank you. That's more or less everybody has voted, Chair, and that's uh, endorsed. Thank you. Thank you, Kath. Then we go to item four, consideration on, on any matter referred to this committee in accordance with the call-in procedure. There are none. Item five, the Environmental and Sustainability Scrutiny Committee Forward Work Programme, which is pages seven to 18. Kath. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to advise members, the work programme is at Appendix 1 on page 11 of your packs. Um, as members can see, the next meeting is on the 18th of May, and we have two items, the update on the sport and active recreation strategy and the contract tracing service update. So um, unless members have got any uh, changes they want to suggest, I'd ask members to support um, us publishing it on the Council website. Anyone got, any, anyone got any questions? If not, someone move that we accept the, the forward workload. I'll move, Chair. Is that seconded? I second that one, Chair. Councillor right. Adams. Go to a vote then, Kath. Yes, Chair, it's just appeared just shortly. Hold on. No, I just we don't have answers. Now we went for a 25 minute drive and then parked in Goodwood Street. Councillor <laughs> <laughs> Kent, we can hear what you're saying. Could, Sorry. Could all, could all members please put off their mics until they, unless they're going to speak later on? Thank you. Councillor Priest, do you want to give a verbal um, endorsement of the work program?
that's the piece is on mute, so I don't know if he's saying he wants to support it, but it's, it's a part of my majority anyway, Chair. Okay, thank you for that. Right, then we go to item six to receive and consider the following cabinet report. No, there was no call in, so that won't be discussed. Thank you for that. Then we go then to receive and consider the following scrutiny reports. And the first one is the <coughs> item seven, directed performance assessment, six months up to, uh, update to 2020, which are pages 19 to 72. And Mark Williams will be leading on this. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, obviously, members, the reason for me introducing this tonight as, a, as opposed to a cabinet member, which would be the norm, is that this is a directorate performance assessment and it covers you know, a whole raft of services across the directorate, which span a number of cabinet portfolios. So, um, you know, it, it, un, unfair to ask one particular cabinet member to introduce this when it covers a number of, of other cabinet members' portfolios. So, um, you, you will recall probably just over 12 months ago, we adopted this, well, a little more than that actually, probably 18 months ago, we adopted this new approach to reporting performance called the DPA, Directed Performance Assessment. And this scrutiny committee was the first scrutiny committee to, as, as a pilot to receive one of those reports. So this is the second time you've actually seen um, this format. The one thing I would say, obviously, this is the community's directed. So this DPA does include regen and planning. But obviously, regen and planning report to the regen and housing scrutiny committee. So the elements of this that are related to regen and planning um, have already been through scrutiny committee and obviously are, are not for tonight. But certainly got Rob Harch on here, who's head of public protection and community and leisure services. Marcus Lloyd in terms of infrastructure. Mark Williams, unfortunately, couldn't be here. Uh, in terms of property, but I can cover any of those any of those items off. So obviously we we we're here to to answer any questions you may have. Um, also, obviously worth pointing out that this is the DPA for the first six months of uh, the current year, so the the twenty twenty one financial year. Um, we all know what's happened during that period. You know, it's been a really different and difficult, challenging, tough. You know, the, the number of adjectives describe it year. Obviously, the first six months of last year, April to September, was was literally when the pandemic first hit. So when we were thrown into some some real turmoil ac across the UK. Um, also, it was immediately after we dealt with a couple of fairly catastrophic storms in terms of Storm Kira, which uh, we had a lot of wind damage and trees down. And then even worse than that was Storm Dennis, where we had lots of flooding, us and RCT probably being the two worst hit authorities in Wales. So, you know, we were still in in sort of mode of recovering from Storm Dennis when we went into the sort of COVID situation and lockdown. So it's been a very challenging year, as you know, it's been a very tough year. And this is the first six months of that year, which is probably the toughest part of it. The one thing I'd like to place on, on record as, as the director in terms of the minutes is to thank the staff who've been absolutely impeccable in terms of their approach to the pandemic. Um, you know, the way they've stepped up the plate, done different things, done their normal things differently, you know, put their own jobs in the bin in some cases and gone to do something completely different. As an authority, we've seamlessly continued to deliver our frontline services. You've seen some other authorities close services down, you know, some authorities close, for example, garden and food waste collection services down. We didn't, we continued. Obviously, there are things that we've had to stop because it's been forced on us. We had to close leisure centres. They remain closed. We had to close our household waste recycling centres for, for a time in, in the early pandemic. There were certain services we were forced to stop, but everything that we were legally allowed to operate, we continue to operate. Um, you know, and the staff have done an absolutely fantastic job. Support of members has also been fantastic. And, you know, as we sit here today, that's why this DPA still looks fairly good because of the efforts of everyone involved and also um, you know, place on, on record my thanks to colleagues in corporate finance for, for kind of steering us through this financially as well. So I just wanted to set that scene, members. Um, as I said, it's the first six months of, of probably the most difficult year any of us have ever seen. Um, and, you know, and we've come out to that quite well. Obviously, we're not out of it yet. Uh, we're, st we're still in you know, lockdown measures. But obviously, myself, Marcus, Rob, happy to answer any questions that you may have.
Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I lost it again. It just went off. It's back now. Mark? Uh, yeah, I, I just finished here. Thanks. All right. No, I lost it. I had to re, re access. Right. Uh, I've had questions. Uh, first of all, Anne on page 27. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I just wondered with regards to the LED lighting programme with the uh, transfer and park night lighting, whether you've had any further pushback, um, given all the publicity that has been recently with um, women's safety and, and street lighting. Uh, I can't speak. I, I, Chair, I, I can come in and answer that one. Yes. I can't speak. Uh, we've had... Um, Probably, I think it's two inquiries regarding park night lighting and uh, recent events. Um, what we have uh, give assurance is that we would continually monitor this. It was in the reports that we brought forward, um, which we are doing. Um, and we we have done what doing implementation and work very closely with Gwent Police. What we have done as well recently is we've formalised that more. So for the next 12 months, because we've only just completed the full implementation during January. So the whole rollout is now complete across the whole borough. Um, every quarter we will meet with Gwent Police and review any concerns they have and look at the crime uh, statistics right the way across the borough and uh, see whether there's anything that needs addressing. So that is formally in place now for the next 12 months and then we may have another formal review at the end of the 12 months following full implementation, which will probably be after um, the next uh, local government elections, which is probably be May June time next year. All right, Dan. Thank you. Right, and also another question on page twenty nine on food and garden waste. Oh yeah, sorry. I just um, I was reading about the um, negotiations with Ronthakun and Taff, and I just wondered if you could give any more information on that. Yeah, I can answer that one again, Chair. Yes. Um, Yes, uh, we've obviously it's, it's slowed down, unfortunately, um, because obviously the, the pandemic, but uh, discussions are back up and running. Uh, we met with them just before Christmas. We've done some trial loads in the, the last couple of months to their facility um, where they've done a compositional analysis of the materials we've been taking in there. We're now into um, discussions regarding uh, gate fees and the, the proposals that uh, they want to put on the table. Well, once they are concluded, um, we will obviously report that back and, and make a decision on the best way forward. So it, it is ongoing and uh, we get into the um, nuts and bolts end of it. Just to clarify, though, Chair, those negotiations are not about food and garden waste. They're about dry recyclables. So plastic right. bottles, cans, etc. They're not about food. Those negotiations with RCT are nothing to do with food and garden waste. OK. All right, Dan. Right, okay. And then the next uh, question you got, page uh, 51, risks on household waste recycling centres. Yeah, sorry, yeah, there was um, something in the report about um, proposed booking system for uh, waste centres, waste transfer centres, is that correct? Yes, that, that is correct. Um, we've undertaken an online survey to see what um, the public's uh, views are. Uh, what we want to do to supplement that is, as soon as uh, lockdown allows, do some face-to-face -face surveys with users of the facility to, to give them a more rounded view of um, the, the views of people, because um, some people may use them in, very infrequently and may have views that um, when they turn up there, there's, there's no queues, and uh, may then have a, a view that a booking system may be a bad thing. Whereas you may have more frequent users that may be sitting in queues regularly, um, may have a different view. So what we want to try and do is get a good balance between the survey results. So we've done the online survey. What we're waiting now is for uh, an opportunity as soon as lockdown allows to do a face-to-face -face survey with uh, users at the facility. And we'll, we'll bring all that together then into a report before we make any decisions. 
Okay, thank right you. On? Right. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else got any questions on this item? Councillor Ellsworth, we've got his hand up. Look at the hand up. Right, Mike. Colin Ellsbury had, uh, had his hand up for long before me. All right, chair. then. Okay, Colin. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, I, I just two questions. Um, to Marcus is the first one, following on what uh, what Anne has, has talked about. Um, I got quite a few calls about the um, booking system or possible booking system from people uh, who only heard about it from word of mouth because they're not online, they don't have social media. Um, so they were a bit angry that uh, this was being done and they didn't know about it mm -hmm. and they didn't have a chance to engage. Um, I appreciate you're going to do face to face with users, but is it going to be any other form of contacting people? Um, because I noticed that we all had a leaflet about the LDP. Um, the second one is um, in relation to that, the um, the queues are pretty bad on the weekends. Um, but in the weeks, they're not so bad. And I think a lot of the, the reason why there are queues is because we are in a lockdown. And to be honest, most of the people I speak to, it's, it's the way for them to get out. Um, they're using it as a trip, a, a day trip. Um, they go into the, the shops as a day trip. They go into the the um, uh, the the, the tip, etc. Um, and I think when people get back into work, um, more work mode, I don't think it's going to be such an issue because if we go back two years before the pandemic and before this, there didn't seem to be much of a, a problem apart from on a Sunday morning. And I have to put my hand up there because I'm, I'm often sitting in a queue on a Sunday morning. Um, so yeah, those are my, those are my questions. Thank you. Uh, with regard to the, the first question, um, the, we, we've publicised it widely to try and get as much interaction as possible, but no, we haven't undertaken um, a, a leaflet drop to all of the houses in, in the borough or anything with regard to that. But given that we are also going to do a face-to-face -face uh, uh, dialogue, um, I, I see no reason why um, we can't take views from anyone that you're aware of who wants to add any weight one way or the other. So quite happy to take those on board if any, if you know anyone who wants to feed in. Um, and also with regards to the, the queue element and people being back in work. Some, yeah, the weekdays may be slightly different, but what we've got to look at is what's going to happen longer term with people's working patterns. Are we going to go back to where people were working previously? Personally, I, I don't think so. There will be some sectors that will have to, but there will be, I think, a lot more agile, flexible working going forward. And I think um, people's um, use of their time may be different. Um, as, as you point out yourself, there comes from Ellsbury, that you do sit in queues on, on a Sunday morning. That's probably not the best use of, of your time. Um, you probably want to like to drive into there. Um, dispose of uh, whatever recycling you've got and, and leave. And from um, an expediency point of view, that's probably easier and from a control point of view as well, better for for yourself and for the facility and for other users around the facility, because a number of these are on industrial estates. Um, and when there are queues, it's the dis disruption to the other businesses as well that we need to be taken into account. It's not just um, the people sitting in the queue because it does affect the access to the industrial areas. All right, Carl. Yeah, OK, thank you. Thank you, right, Marcus. The right, only other thing right. is I'm Sorry. assuming this will come back to this committee once all the consultation is finished. Yes. Oh, fine. OK, <laughs> all right. Ch Chair, yeah. Chair, can I just add something to, to what Marcus has just said, if you don't mind, please? Yes, you can. I you can jump the um, queue. Go on. Yeah, just just to add, uh, Councillor Ellsby raised the, the fair point that obviously people are treating it like a, like a day out, and in some of the queues, it is a day out. Um, but <laughs> yeah. um, the other factor is that you know one of the one of the reasons for the queue is because of COVID restrictions and only two cars on the ramp at any one time, whereas you know perhaps in normal circumstances there might be three or four cars on the ramp, um, actually disposing away. So. You know, that's, that's also a factor in terms of the queue. The, there are, I think, now 14 out of the 22 authorities in Wales have implemented booking systems. 
quite seamlessly, no problem at all, very well received, and it is it is eradicated the queuing problem. Thank you, Mark. Right, I come to Mike at last. That's okay. Been happy to uh, to wait and listen to those uh, those answers. Uh, and to Marcus is yeah, very pleased to hear that we are going to be doing this as much face to face uh, contact with the users when they're there. But of course, we don't know how long in front of us is going to be before we can safely take lots of uh, those kind of conversations uh, on. Uh, hopefully, it'll be quick. Um, as far as Colin Ellsbury's uh, concerns about uh, the weekends, no, if you come to uh, Penn Main site, you will see queues on almost any time of the week. It doesn't make a lot of difference. And on Monday, uh, they were actually queued right up to the, the junction with the main road again. Uh, you can go there on the weekend and drive straight in to almost to the ramp, which uh, I've been able to do lately. It's a very, very mixed uh, usage for, uh, for those at the site controlling it and the people who arrive there for their sometimes half a day out in, in the car. Um, yes, as Mark, uh, as Mark just told us, many of our neighbouring authorities are also using this booking system. Um, I suppose it depends, uh, Marcus, on if an awful lot of people get online or phone to, to book the site, how many days you might have to wait. Uh, and I've been used to popping along because I'm so close to it, almost within five minutes of making uh, the waste in the back of the car. Uh, it's, it's something that I think is probably inevitable that we will have to go to a booking system because it will be very dif difficult to argue that because so many others are doing it, it, it would seem strange that we, ha we can stay the way we've been. One of the big problems that, um, Marcus, if you want to have a quick word with Rob Hartson after the meeting, the number of complaints I've had about the noise and the way that we work over Permain. But uh, well, glad that you're going to be talking to people who are actually using it. Sorry that not so many are actually going online and seeing this information. Thanks very much, all. All right, Marcus, you can be, can you, do you want to come back on that first and then I can go to Steve. Okay, yeah, just, just one quick one, please, Chair. Um, it's just to um, show Councillor Adams with regards to the, the booking system. What we have, have done is done counts as well of the vehicles that are using the facility and then looked at how a booking system would work around that. And, and the numbers would allow it to, to operate quite efficiently. Um, so you wouldn't be waiting three days before you could dispose of your waste. You should be able to most of the time book a slot for the following day. So I, I don't think that should be a, should be an issue. And the feedback we've had from other authorities as well is they finding it exactly the same, working very well, and you can normally book a, a slot for the following day. Thank you, uh, Marcus. Right, Steve? Hi, oh, yeah, thanks. Um, I wasn't going to talk speak on this at the moment, but it's just come up when Carl brought it up as well, then with the booking system. I can see it being great for our staff work in these um, amenity sites because they can sometimes you go up and it could, I spoke to one of the lads and he said it's five o'clock he said and we're still trying to turn cars around he said oh, well, we're, we're finished in work but we cannot leave work and I think on that light it's going to be brilliant but have any of the other authorities before we implement this will we look at other authorities um, fly tipping incidents because if someone brags they booked their spot then they couldn't make that spot due to any accidents on the road or other things. What are they going to do if they've only got that time off? If they've only got that time available to go to use our sites? I think there's an increased danger of them fly tipping. And that's something that would have to be monitored, especially outside the civic immunity sites. You've really got to do here. You've got the big lane, you've got no cameras, and there's always rubbish just being dumped where people have gone up, skipped the shirt, and they've just chucked it out the car. Um, um, my second point is going back to the performance um, document. There seems to be nothing in there about highways waste 
highway bin waste and dog waste bins because you know I think it's councils have having to, have to, to get them empty there seems to be no um rota where they just you know they, they visited regularly because we're phoning up continually to get these bins empty and I'm not sure if it's problems with vehicles or, or staffing levels but you know, guaranteed three or four days, three or four times every two weeks, you've got to phone up to get these bins emptied. And fair play to the staff, they come up, they do them. But there seems to be no frequency in the visits. Is that something that's going to can be looked at? Marcus. Oh, Thank you, Chair. Rob, oh, Rob. Um, thank you, Councillor Kent. Uh, yeah, the, there is a frequency. There is a rotor in place and the... Um, bins are on a schedule to, to be emptied. We have had some resourcing issues over the last 12 months. Um, that's mainly down to the fact that we've focused on our waste collection services because we've had sickness absence, self-isolation absence, um, and all of those sorts of things that have uh, come along with it, and um, people shielding within the service. And we have pulled resources from the been emptying and the litter picking to make sure that the collections maintain uh, service was maintained. So that there has been some issues. We recognise that, but there is um, a rotor in place, and um, we have looked at bringing agency to try and increase um, our resources to make sure that uh, they can try and get that back on track. With the dog fouling issues, um, I think what we found is that those dog fouling bins are not full. What you're finding is because people don't want to touch the handle to open the bin to put the, the dog waste in, they start putting a bag on top of the bin. And as soon as one person puts a bag on top of the bin, everyone else does. We've done some social media around that. Um, we've had uh, the boys who, who empty those bins take videos when they turn up there to show what it looks like when they turn up with the dog bags all around the bin and on top of the bin. And they open up the bin and the bin kit might only be a third full. But it's just literally the first person, as soon as they put a bag on top of it, everyone else just follows suit. Um, and, and that's some of the problems. And I think that's probably down to the COVID situation at the moment, where people uh, are a little bit reluctant to touch things and they haven't been opening the, the bin. We have looked at options of removing the lids to make it easier. But then when it rains, they fill up with water. Um, you also got the flies getting in there and all those sorts of things. And um, it's, it's, it is a, is a bit of an issue at the moment, but hopefully that will resolve itself. And we, we're trying to do some PR around it to try and um, ensure that people do use the bins appropriately. Right, Denver. Fine, thank you, Chair. Yeah, one or two things. I know, uh, earlier on, you said about uh, letting people know they, uh, ways to do it so they can book their time. Um, well, they've got to go to the site each and every one of us, I should imagine, over the years, go to the site at least once a month. Um, why don't we take uh, uh, their, what they want to do, why they're there? They've got to check their, whether they can dump there or not. That's one way to find out exactly the numbers it's using. Because not every resident you know, in our council is going to use the tip. So that'd be one way to get hold of, I don't know, it wouldn't be no harder than if you have to email them or, 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 or letter them. Uh, and the other thing um, uh, they said about uh, the, the queuing and all that, um, I think, uh, as uh, Mark said, with with the COVID being in like it is, I used it from right from the start when there was no COVID and it was in and out, no problem at all. I think I think that a lot of things is happening with COVID that no matter what we do. We are not going to get to the bottom of it until it, until we have got through this pandemic. But I I will agree with Mark when we do the times I use it the, the site when it wasn't pandemic run it was no problem at all and I can see it improving a tremendous amount. I think to put in something into practice to to, to try and cover the COVID and we don't even know how long it's going to be. I think we're giving ourselves a lot of work and and no need of it. Thank you, Chair. Okay, I've got no other member asking for any questions or comments. None at all. Right, could uh, someone move and note that report? Move. Seconded. 
I'll second it. Okay. Anyone yeah. against the report at all? No. Can I thank the officers for their uh, submissions and uh, answering the questions? Watch this space, that's all I can say. Right. We then go to the uh, next item on the agenda, which is item six. Review of the contract management arrangements on waste services, ironically. Pages 73 to, to 78. Councillor Nigel George, who is the cabinet member, will open the discussion. Nigel, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Cha Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the purpose of the report is to outline the proposal for strengthening contract management arrangements within the waste services. In summary, the report sets out details of the range of high value contracts that are managed within waste services and provide details of the proposals to strengthen current contract management arrangements. The proposed approach will ensure that all contracts are maximised in terms of service delivery, regulatory requirements and that of the wider social value benefits are realised. At the end of the proposed two-year contract management review period, an analysis of the effectiveness of the service model will be undertaken to determine if, the, if this approach to contract management can be applied more generally to other service areas across the Council. The report also includes a proposal to fund an estimated cost of around £410,000 to undertake a contract management review. Uh, the recommendations before for you tonight is that scrutiny committee considers the content of the report and the funding proposal prior to cabinet consideration on the 7th of April. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Nigel. Marcus, do you want to make any comments? I think uh, Councillor George has covered it uh, quite well there. Um, what we need to, to focus on is it's not just the way service as well. Um, these officers will be looking, although they, they will come in and focus on waste services in the first instance, there are changes to the, the procurement regulations um, within, within Wales. So there's going to need to be training across a number of areas with regard to contract management going forward. So they will be utilised elsewhere over that fixed two year term. Um, but the, the initial focus will be on waste services, but they will be used much wider as well. Thank you. Right. We have had a question from Councillor Andrew Whitcomb. It's page 74.5.6. Andrew. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm intrigued to know, to, know uh, to find out how you actually procure a critical friend. Um, it, 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 uh, I've actually d done some work on, on releasing contracts and bidding from contracts and I used a critical friend. I'd be interested to see how you're going to procure that position. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I don't know whether Mark wants to come in on this one. He's put his hand up. Mark? You're on mute, Mark. No, we, no, we've asked him. He's dodged yeah. it now, Marcus. So, uh, so I was on mute. Yeah, <laughs> Councillor Whitcomb, thanks for the question. A valid question. Uh, you know, as you're probably aware, local government has a history of doing stuff like peer reviews, whether they're specific service peer reviews, corporate peer reviews, and generally would look to the WLGA database for those type of individuals to come in and act as a critical friend. So, I think that would be our starting point. OK, thank you, Mark, and thank you, Chair. Thanks very much. Right, Anne, you asked a question on page 74.5.3 to 5.5 .5 on waste recycling contracts. Thank you. Yeah, it refers to a two year um, contract review, but some of these uh, waste recycling contracts, they involve millions of pounds of taxpayers' money and um, some recycling contractors are given 15 year contracts. So I wonder how we ensure performance targets are met and that contracts are delivering value for money. It states in 5.4 that there was a drop off in performance in 2019 and 20 due to one recycling contractor. So how do we ensure competitiveness and where is the incentive to perform if you have a 15 year contract 
and also raise the fairness to other contractors. Marcus. The procurement um, of the contract there would be in an open, transparent manner and other contractors would be able to bid for the work. So they wouldn't just be given a 15 year contract, they would have to bid for that work over 15 years. The reason why the contracts would be so long would be the investment that they have to make in the facilities. So when you look at um, the project Gwyrdd project, you'll see they have to build incinerators, etc. in Cardiff to deal with uh, the waste that they have to incinerate. So to recoup that significant investment, um, you've got to look at uh, longer term contracts for that sort of um, waste streams. Uh, and that's similar with uh, what we do with um, the organics waste. Again, they've got to look at anaerobic digestion uh, plants, which cost millions to, to build. So that's why you, you look at those. But it, it is an open and fair competition. Others could bid for it and, and build their facilities uh, at the outset of the contracts. Um, but what is built into the contract then is key performance indicators throughout <coughs> the contract that they have to achieve whether it be dealing with the waste within a timely manner or achieving so much recycling from, from the waste, etc. So there are key performance indicators. Uh, with regard to the, the drop off in performance, that was in regard to, to one specific waste stream with um, an end supply chain supplier that was picked up by um, Natural Resources Wales. Um, so our contract, we dealt with the waste in accordance with the contract we have with our contractor. They had subcontract arrangements in for the specialist material um, that, that was um, carpets and textiles that were passed on to a, 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 another party then to, to recycle. Unfortunately, they weren't recycling. So this is why some of the um, data and uh, analysis, data analytical officers that we've got in the, um, the proposal are there to try and look at all of the detail to make sure all of the key performance indicators and try and follow um, the data through to show that there's evidence of where the outturn is um, and that everyone is complying throughout the, the supply chain. Um, it, it worked in this case, um, but it was picked up by a, a, an external party with regard to Natural Resources Wales and reported it back. But there, there was that trail there that showed that everyone from our point of view and our contractor's point of view dealt with everything in accordance with what they should but the end supply chain didn't. Um, but yeah, there, there is performance measures in place in all of the contracts to make sure that uh, it is all achieved in accordance with uh, um, the requirements of the contract. So are there any penalties for not complying or? Yes, there are. Yeah. So, and that's some of the discussions we're, we're having at the moment because um, they are key targets that Welsh Government has set. So Welsh Government can um, impose fines on us for meet, not meeting those targets and similarly what we would have is something um, like a, a, a follow through within the contract then so if we get fined subsequently our supplier will get fined because we put it in the contract it's like a like a Teflon too but easy to, to describe it like it goes straight through to them so it's in their interest to make sure it's dealt with appropriately so that if we we don't pass the fines on onto them and these new proposals will help. Uh, yes. Help All right, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Colin. Yeah, thanks, Tudor. Um, Marcus, you, the, the figures quoted in the report, are they the exactly how much the officers, new officers would get paid or are they at the top of the scale that we go to? Uh, and second one, um, can we not combine procurement policy with principal procurement officer? We save a fortune. The, the uh, figures quoted, Councillor Ellsbury, are included on costs, so they're not actually salary costs, they are on costs on top of those, so they, they have been included. Um, we've worked on this with um, the, as you see, the author of the report is, is Steve Harris, the um, Section 151 officer, and Liz Lucas has had input from a procurement perspective, um, and that's what they think is needed to, to assist us um, um, with implementing this, but also, as I mentioned earlier on, is looking at 
the changes in legislation with regard to procurement policy and it's literally retraining the whole of the procurement team and contracts officers within the the authority in the way that we're going to be dealing with contracts going forward because of the change in legislation so it is slightly wider than just uh, coming in to deal with the waste service okay all right thanks i, I, I didn't hear that. your answer because it was breaking up but yeah no problem thank you marcus Stephen, steve you're muted thank you. right. i'm running more oh it's alan sorry daughter daughter introduction uh, interruption um with the regards to the value of the contracts on the waste system has there been an uplifting cost percentage wise on these contracts you know how much has there been a market a marked uplift in the cost of these contracts to the council um compared to if we've had two or three year contracts compared three years ago is it a, you know percentage wise how much has the cost increased in front of everything each contract would need to be looked at um on, on its own, I know Mark wants to come in on this, but obviously an annual contract, there'd be, there'd be no uplift, it'd be whatever the contract is. Um, and that's generally the case for probably a one to three year contract. Anything over that, particularly the 15 year contracts, they would have indices inbuilt um, linked to whether it be um, the uh, CPI or, or whatever that, that there is, there'd be some sort of indice regarding price index that would be part of the the increase that uh, would be set in the contract right at the start. I don't know if one, Mark wanted to add anything to that. Mark, is he trained up on the system? Oh, yeah, I was muted again. Yeah, the, the long the longer term contracts like project with like the organics contract do have contract indices built into the contract. Generally, you don't tend to get value for money with just doing annual contracts because there's you know it's 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 quite risky for a contractor, uh, you know, to, to take, take on business for a year. They gear themselves up whether it's employee wise, shift wise, whatever it may be, um, and then there's no guarantee going forward. So. In our experience, short term sort of hand to mouth contracts don't necessarily offer the best value for money. OK, Steve. Yeah. No further hands going up. If not, Adrian, could you vote a thanks for the staff? You're on mute. Adrian, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry, Jay. Uh, just one thing that um, Councillor Bob Owens have emailed some questions. I don't know if it's allowed. It was in the show conversation. Well, as far as I'm concerned, if he's in contact with the committee. Jay, do you want me to put him in, show, in the chat function? Yes. Thank you. I'll do that now. I think if we carry on meeting like this, we're going to have to have lip reading lessons as well. Jay, while, uh, while Kath is doing that, um, I'd just like to personally thank uh, all our frontline services for the, the sterling work they've done. Just really echoing what uh, Mark Williams said earlier on. Um, from Even from the, the bin collection, like I said, they, they've never missed a beat as far as I'm concerned. And uh, I just like to um, put my personal thanks at uh, if Mark or Marcus or um, Mark Williams could pass this on to our teams. Thanks. Certainly Thank will. You. Thank you, Councillor Hussey. Chair, I've put, put three questions in the chat that's come in from Councillor Owen. Right. Um, I, well, I'll, I'll, I'll kick off, Chair, if I can. So, no. There's no requirement to have contracts for five years. There's no requirement on a on a contract term. It's whatever whatever, obviously that that the service requires and that, that offers the best value for money. You know, in fact, there's loads of factors to be considered. So, um, I'm not sure where Councillor Owen has got this is circa five years from. Um, that that certainly isn't isn't the case. Um, uh, what's he say? I'm unaware that we have as an authority recently taken a. Procurement reevaluation. Can this be confirmed? 
I'm not exactly sure what he means there. Is he talking about one specific contract? Is he talking about a review of the procurement service? So I, I'm unable to answer that one. Could we, could we ask him to contact you outside of the meeting? Yeah, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I probably Marcus has, Marcus has already answered question two when he talked about this is a bit wider than the waste service and you know there's there's training and, and all sorts of things to be done right across the authority. Um, so I think Marcus has already answered question two, Chair. Um, uh, the answer to question three is no, this hasn't come about because we failed a recycling target. Uh, Marcus has explained why that why that happened. This isn't as a result of that. This is largely about reviewing our contract management across the authority and also the change in the legislation now that we've come out of Europe. Right, thank you. So on question one, if you could put it on the minutes, the question and your answer for the record, all right? Yeah, sure. Right, anyone else? Can I yes, sorry, ask now? Chair, yeah, can I just, sorry, um, Sorry about it, and I apologise for asking another Where's one. Where's the voice it, coming it, from, Colin? Yeah, Colin Osbury. Um, Mark just said something about uh, changing the legislation since we came out of Europe. Um, what input? What impact has that had on our on our on the way we work? I wasn't aware that coming out of Europe would would affect our waste management and recycling. So uh, I don't want to take up all night. Um, if you want to do it via email, fine. But just what exactly uh, are we doing, having to do differently? No, I, I, Councillor Asbury wasn't talking about waste management particularly, it's procurement legislation. Ah, oh, right, okay, fine. Um, okay. Procurement legislation is due to change, because obviously it was the it was the European procurement rules that we you know, we were bound by as a member right. state, and obviously that the UK is now having to put its own uh, regime into place to replace the EU procurement rules. So it was procurement legislation I was talking about. Fine, right. okay. All right, All right, Colin. Okay, yeah, thanks, Chair, thanks for that. All right. Right, uh, no other questions. Um, <clears throat> can I move the recommendation 3.1? Is that seconded? Second, that chair. Right, go to a vote, Kath, please. Yes, chair. Just hold on a moment till the PFA out. If anyone can't see it, can they please let us know verbally? That's carried, Chair. Thank you. Can I, before the meeting finish, uh, as a Chairman, thank the members for their support and their uh, commitments over the last 12 months, a very hard 12 months as it happens. So I appreciate the input that you put into it, and I wish you all and the officers good health for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Chair. 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 All right, all the best to you anyway.